that you help me to share your message accurately and that you just move up and down the aisles and help us to not just receive information today, but hear from heaven a word in our hearts that will bring great results in our lives. We're open, Father, to anything that you want to do during this time, and we give you the praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we're continuing the series that we've been studying entitled Reset. Does anybody enjoy Reset so far? Of course, we, we talked about the fact that from time to time, everybody needs a reset. And of course, when we talk about a reset, we're talking about really uh, setting, adjusting, or fixing something in a new or different way. Sometimes people talk about resetting priorities or resetting prices or resetting the direction of a business and things along those lines. And when I think of reset, I t tend to think of being a kid playing the old Nintendos where if you were playing against somebody and you didn't like the way your game was going and you were a cheater, you just press reset. And you get, a, get to start all over again. They might be mad at you, but you know what? They can't say they beat you. And, uh, and yet sometimes that's what we need. We need resets in life. And we want resets from time to time because we kind of want a do-over. We want to have better results than what we have right now. And we've learned that God is a God who will give you that, that from time to time, God will, will move in your life and give you a chance to kind of get to do, get a do-over, give you a chance to kind of get things on track so that you can get the better results that you want to have. And so last week, we, we went a little deeper with this, and we talked about how uh, the key to a successful reset is a better understanding, is better understanding and living by the covenant that we have with God. We learned that a covenant is a really a, a legal contract bound by blood. And that if you are somebody that is following Jesus, you already have a covenant with God. Of course, when you think about covenants, and a great example of this is the farmer and the warrior. The farmer is great at producing food, but they can't protect themselves. The warrior can protect themselves, but they can't produce food. So they enter into a covenant together. And the farmer says, I'll feed you if you protect me. And the warrior says, I'll protect you if you feed me. So both sides are better because of that covenant. And that's what we have with God, except that we really aren't offering much to God. God is offering a whole lot to us. But once again, if you're someone that's chosen to follow Jesus, you are in a covenant with God right now. And, and of course, if we look at the Bible, honestly, we could look at the Bible and really come to the conclusion that the Bible is really just a book of covenants. That is a book of covenants. You can see covenant that God made with Abraham early on in Genesis. You can see the covenant God made with Israel. And then the Bible talks about the covenant that God made with us through Jesus. And, of course, we learned that last week, that Jesus came to bring us a new covenant with God. That is different than the old covenant that Israel had, which was kind of a bilateral conditional covenant that said, if you will, I will. Jesus came to bring us a new covenant that was better. Somebody say better. That covenant was promissory. That was the kind of covenant where God just simply said, I will. I mean, anybody glad we got a new covenant with God, a better covenant? Where God just basically saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this as long as you're in the covenant. And so we learned then that we've been set free from the old covenant. That, you know, all those 600 commands that you read about in the old covenant, we don't have to keep all those commands. Thank God. We don't have to, you know, have a goat in the back and, and, and sacrifice the goat and all those kind of things that they had to do because Jesus came to bring us a new covenant. And we learned then that it's really important for us not to mix the covenants. To, and that's where a lot of people are, a lot of believers are. In fact, it's really what caused some of the, the worst atrocities in our history that were done in the name of Christ. Of course, they weren't really in his name. People just thought they were. And what they did was they took some old covenant stuff, some new covenant stuff, threw it together and kind of came up with something else. And that's why they acted the way they did because they thought God was behind it and God was saying, no, that's not what my new covenant says. And so we learned that we need to make the point of not mixing covenants ourselves. And the way to do that is to really pay attention to who God is talking to when we're reading Scripture. Because God usually talks to one or three groups of people in Scripture. He's talking to Israel, the Jews. He's talking to uh, the church, which are Christians. Or he's talking to the nations. And you can get in trouble when you take what he said to the Jews and try to make it apply to the church. Or what he says to the church and try to make it apply to the nations. 
So you got to pay attention to who he's talking to when you read the Bible, and you got to study the Bible from the perspective of the new covenant, that you need to take your cue from the covenant God made with you. Now, just a few things to help you with this. I know there's a little meat here, but that's okay. We're going we're gonna to do that from time to time around here. I want to just kind of help you to see, once again, the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant was one where you had to have animal sacrifices to deal with sin. Under the new covenant, Jesus was the sacrifice. He didn't have to be sacrificed again. The animals had to be sacrificed every year. The second thing, under the old covenant, your sins were covered. Anybody ever, ever um, have a kid or, or as a kid, you know, when, when your mama said clean your room, instead of actually cleaning your room, just kind of threw everything under the bed, you know, and then your mama knew what she was doing, came in there, looked under the bed, said, you, didn't, you better clean this room. Well, under the old covenant, that's kind of how our sins were. They weren't taken care of. They were just covered by the blood of, of those animals. But the blood of animals couldn't get rid of them, but the blood of Jesus could. Under the new covenant, our sins are washed away. Under the old covenant, they had over 600 commands that they had to follow to be in it and to really receive the benefits of the covenant. Under the new covenant, we have one command. We're going to talk about that today. Under the old covenant, the best you could do was be a servant of God. Under the new covenant, you can be a son of God. Under the old covenant, the only way you could be right before God was by your actions. Under the new covenant, you can be right before God simply by your faith. Under the old covenant, you were susceptible to the curse of the law. We talked about that a little bit last week. Poverty, sickness, spiritual death, depression, you name it, because of your disobedience. But under the new covenant, you are free from the curse right now. Under the old covenant, ooh, yes, Lord, no, I'm just kidding. Under the old covenant, if you wanted to go to God, you had to go to the temple because God was in the temple. Under the new covenant, you are the temple. God's in you. Under the old covenant, you had to live from the outside in. You know, and if you even want to hear from God, just one, one of the things that you saw in the old covenant was that people would put out a fleece and say, God, if this was wet in the morning, I know you said do this. And if it was dry in the morning, I, was, I know you didn't say it. But under the new covenant, we live from the inside out. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and we can be led by the Holy Spirit in us. Under the old covenant, you have to go to the priest. Under the new covenant, you are the priest. That's why we don't go to a priest for confession because the Bible says if you're a believer, you've been made a priest unto God. You have access to God yourself. And then lastly, and this is different, under the old covenant, the benefit of following God was total prosperity. God would prosper you on your money and your finances in every area. Under the new covenant, the benefit of following God is total prosperity. That is actually the same. You see, under the old covenant, when you obeyed God, you gained access to the blessing of the Lord. That's God's power to prosper you in every area. It'll cause you to be healthy, wealthy, fruitful, you name it. You know, if someone was unable to have kids, the blessing would come on them. They could have kids, you know, protected, etc. Well, that same blessing is available to us under the new covenant. It's the same blessing, and the Bible calls it all grace. You find the Bible talking about all spiritual blessings, example after example. And so you can still have health, wealth, victory, protection, you know, all of that under the new covenant. And I know some people that teach along these lines, they like to take the position that, well, you know, when y'all look at those old covenant blessings and those promises, you're, you're out of line because they don't apply to us. That's just for Israel. The problem with that argument is that we are still talking about the same God. He's still the same God, and he has the same intentions for us as his sons as he did for them as his servants. The thread that runs through both covenants is that we have a loving God who wants his best for his people. And so his nature nor his will for man's life didn't change because he entered into a new covenant. What changed was how you would get there. Under the old covenant, it had to be by blood sacrifices, all things we talked about. Now it's simply through receiving the sacrifice of Jesus. So I believe it is error to pretend that the God that wanted to give Israel hope and a future in the Old Testament doesn't want to give his, his sons hope and a future in the New Covenant. In fact, you can look at a lot of New Covenant scriptures and you can see things like that it may be well with you. God saying, I want you to prosper and be in health. God saying, I'll make you rich so you can be generous. That's all New Testament. 
So we see that in the New Testament. We can go to the Old and see that God said it there as well and see, all right, that, that's a good promise for me to look at there as long as I'm looking at it within the context of it applying to me today. I know that's deep. Y'all with me? I know I haven't even got to the message. I'm just walking through some stuff because I messed up last week, so I'm making sure y'all got it. One more, one more proof about that. The Bible gives us seven redemptive names of God in the Old Testament. Anybody ever know any of his redemptive names? Jehovah Jireh, my what? Provider, right? Jehovah Rapha, Lord, that heal of me. Of course, the New Testament says, by his stripes you were, right? Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our. In the New Testament, he says, peace be unto you. Jehovah Tiskinu, the God who makes things. We can go on and on and on. He didn't change. He's still Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Tiskinu, Jehovah, all of them. He's still your shepherd. He's still your banner. He's still all of that. So all the blessings of the old covenant still belong to us. In fact, last week we learned under our new covenant, we have access to all the blessings of heaven. That includes any, any good thing that God would give his people in the old covenant and any good thing he would give to us in the new covenant. I like what one minister said. They said, what makes a $20 bill better than a $10 bill? Is that the 10 is in the 20, right? The blessings of the old covenant is, is in the new covenant. Of course, we saw that in Galatians 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Well, that's part of uh, what, what, what we're talking about today. But let's talk about what are some of the new covenant blessings that we have because we are following Jesus and we are in a new covenant. Remember, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundant. So although they had a covenant with God in the Old Testament or even during his days, it wasn't a covenant for life the way God wanted us to have it. In fact, he said to Peter in Matthew 16, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. So here, here are the kingdom benefits that we have in a new covenant. Number one, righteousness with God, meaning our sins aren't counting against us. Anybody glad our sins aren't counting against us? He doesn't count them. He acts like they never happened. I, don't know about, I think that we should be praising God more. But I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of sins that need to be discounted. Don't look at me like that. You know you have too. We are once again sons of God, meaning we're in the family of God now. We have the Holy Ghost in us, which means we can lead by him. We also have the Holy Ghost on us. In the Old Testament, the only people that were really anointed the vast majority of the time was the prophet, the priest, or the king. They had, they're the only ones that really had God's power on them. There were some cases where you see some other things. But, and I'm talking about the, the power to minister to others. And under the new covenant, if you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is not the same as being saved. When you're saved, you choose to follow Jesus. The Holy Ghost comes to live in your heart. But there's something beyond that that God wants you to have. That's why in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was talking to the apostles, who had already had the Holy Ghost come and live in their heart, because he said, but receive the Holy Ghost. The Bible says when he breathed it, the Holy Ghost came to live in them. He said, now you'll receive power. I want you to wait in Jerusalem because you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you. Why? So you can be witnesses to me. He was talking about the power to be a witness, power to be used by God to minister to other people. And often when we talk about that, we think about speaking in tongues, and speaking in tongues is a byproduct of receiving that power, but it's not just that so you can speak in tongues. It's so that God can use you to do miracles. And that's the next thing, is under the new covenant, we can do the miracles of Jesus. We can heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, whatever God wants us to do. Another new covenant blessing is that we have the authority of Jesus. We can, in, in the name of Jesus, speak to demons and they have to obey us. We can claim things in the name, or that word literally means the authority of Jesus, just like we are Jesus, and this world has to obey us. That's why the Bible says whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then lastly, and this is the best thing, under the new covenant, we have access to heaven itself. You know, a lot of us have had loved ones pass away even the last month of the year. You know, it always seems like this in December. It just seems like a lot of people always pass in December. And so this last December, I know I was, I was a part of or I was at uh, at least three or four home goings. And the thing that's great about them is when a believer has passed, we can rejoice because we know where they are. 
You know, heaven is just as real as Hawaii. Just because you can't see Hawaii doesn't mean it's not there. The only difference is you don't, you don't, it's not time for you to go to heaven yet. You can go to Hawaii if you get enough money, believe God. But you can't go to heaven. But heaven's way better than Hawaii. We got loved ones sitting in heaven right now, not worried about being a little cold in this music hall. And it is a little cold. I'm sorry about that. We're working on it. But thank God for your coats. And thank God for our building that we're going to get. We're working on it. But, but you know, under the old covenant, when they would die, they didn't get to go to heaven. Jesus talked about Luke 16. There was a place called Abraham's bosom that was actually in the middle of the earth, right across from a hill. And the Bible teaches there was a man by the name of Lazarus who he went down into Abraham's bosom because he was righteous under the old covenant. And there was a, 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 another wicked rich man who went into hell. And so the wicked rich man was in hell tortured, and he can see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. So they were close. He said, come bring me just a little water. Just, just put your finger in some water and put it on the tip of my tongue. And, 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 and Abraham, he actually says to Abraham to have Lazarus do it. And Abraham says to him, there's a great gulf between us. In other words, I can't get over there. Lazarus can't get over there. Then went on to tell him, you had your chance. Listen, I want to tell you, don't don't have been someone who came to church or watched this online and heard about Jesus and reject him for any reason and end up burning in hell, wishing you could have a little tiny bit of water put on your tongue because it would bring relief for any reason. There is no sin on this planet worth two minutes of hell. There is no anger you have at God or at God's people, or at church, to risk hell. None. And you and I don't know if there is a hell. Have you looked at this planet? <laughs> Have you seen the level of suffering in this planet? That is not the result of God. That is the result of God's enemy, Satan. Man, let him in the door. It's kind of like, if you know, you open the door. Yesterday I was going to pick up one of my kids, and, uh, and I was just driving through a neighborhood, and there was this buck sitting right in somebody's front yard. I don't mean a little doe deer. I mean a buck, full antlers, everything. I'm like, man, somebody really could almost shoot that thing. <laughs> well, you know, if you open the door and let him in, of course he's going to wreck your house. That's what happened to this planet. Adam and Eve let Satan in, and he's been stealing, killing, and destroying. And all this evil in this world that people want to blame on God, even the evil in our lives, they're a result of Satan. So... That's what he's done in this earth, and God's still working here. His people are still here. God is, the light is still here. But what happens when there is no light and you're sitting in hell? You think it's awful here. What is hell like? Now, the other side of that is this earth has a lot of great things in it. We enjoy a lot of wonderful things in spite of the fact that Satan is here, in spite of all the suffering. So now if you take away Satan, you take away all the suffering, and now you find yourself in heaven. How good is it there? The Bible talks about there's no crying there. There's no pain there. There's no suffering there. If you have loved ones there, I want you to know they are not wishing they came back down here. They're not saying, hey, you know, I wish I could be there with you. They're saying, hey, you just keep be, stay right so you can join me up here. I, want, no, I ain't going there. You come, you come up here. All right? Heaven's a wonderful thing, and it belongs to us who have chosen to follow Jesus. Now, neither one of these lists I gave you are exhaustive. But these are just some pieces that I wanted to give you. All right, John chapter 13. I want to talk about one thing today. Y'all get anything so far? That was a lot. But some, a lot of it was reviewed. So if you weren't here last week, then you're saying, man, he, I just drank from a fire hydrant, and that's just because you weren't here last week. That's on you. But no, I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. But uh, even if you were, I wanted to make sure we were clear about that. So John chapter 13, and let's, let's look at what Jesus says. And what's interesting here in John chapter 13 is this is right after, I mean literally right after, after Jesus releases Judas to go and betray him. So now the wheels are in motion for him to be betrayed, him to be crucified, and then, of course, him to go to hell in our place and rise again. So he says in, in verse 33, he goes on to talk about how, in fact, verse 32, how now, verse 31, 32, 32, now is the time I'm going to be glorified, and, and, and you know, you, you see me now, you won't see me later. And, and then in verse 34, he says, a new, somebody say new, 
a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this we'll all know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus knew he was about to go. They were entering into a new season, and about to enter into a new covenant. So he gives them the command that God wanted everyone in this new covenant to live according to. He gave a new command that he intended to serve as the governing behavioral ethic for the members of his new family. And that command was simply to love one another. One thing that's interesting about that command is that he didn't say that once. He said it three times in two scriptures. Love one another. By this all men know that you love one another. Love one another. And you're going to see as we get into this today that the Bible says it a lot. Love one another. And something else that's interesting about it is that it implies that love is not, this kind of love is not a feeling. It's not something that you can kind of help or not help. You know, I can't help how I feel. No, this kind of love is a choice. The word that translated love in the New Testament, we know the New Testament is translated from the Greek. That word is agape, and that refers to love in a moral sense, an unconditional love a selfless love, an everlasting love. Frankly, the love God has for us. And isn't that what Jesus said? I want you to love each other like I love you. God's love for us is unconditional. God will love you whether or not you bust hell wide open. You could reject him for eternity. He will still always love you. Doesn't matter what you've done right now. He still loves you more than any person ever could, at least in and of themselves. It's a selfless kind of love. You know, God so loved, Jesus so loved, that he forgot about himself and he allowed himself to be nailed, and have nails put in his hands, nails put on his feet, and to hang on a cross for six hours and go into hell and suffer there, not for himself, but for us. And this love is everlasting. The Bible says in Jeremiah 31 that I have loved you with an everlasting love. So God is saying, no, I want you to love each other like that. I want you to love each other with an unconditional, everlasting, selfless type of love. And what I think is really cool about this, well, I think we should talk about, is what made this commandment different? Because Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Well, you know, there have been talk about love before this, and we're going to see some of those scriptures. What made this commandment new? Well, in the Old Covenant, the commandment was love God, of course. That's part of this. But love as you love yourself. But now Jesus upgrades it. I want you to love each other like I have loved you. Now, that is even more love than how you love yourself. That's on another level. He says, you watch me walk in love with you all. And that's the kind of leader you want to be. The kind where you can say, I want you just to do what I did. It's the kind of parent you want to be, right? He said, man, I've been walking in love with you guys. There were times they got on his nerves. You can read some scripture where you can tell they just got on Jesus' nerves. He's like, Lord, how long must I be with these folk? I mean, you ever read, you know, those scriptures? How long must I deal with this? I mean, he just did a lot better. Some of us, we just start cussing. <laughs> Even Jesus. Let me, let me say this the right way. How long, Lord? So he's saying, you watch me love you, you know, John and Peter and Matthew. I want you to love each other like I have loved you. You know, I used this as, as an example last week. I guess I'll do it again. But I've got my iPhone 11 here. And uh, when I got the iPhone 11, of course, it was an upgrade from the iPhone 8, which is what I have for a while. And the 8 had a home button. Anybody got an iPhone in here? Anybody been saved? No, I'm just kidding. Delivered from the Android. No. I'm just messing around. Don't get offended. I don't want to get DM'd. Pastor, you offended me today. But no. But, the, you know, the, the iPhone 8 had a home button. So if you wanted to do, open the phone, you just had to put your, your thumb on it. The 11 doesn't have that. 
It wants your face. And it took a little adjusting. You know, when I first had it, first couple of days, I'm like, you know, how come I can't get this to open? Because it needs to see my ugly face. Uh, <laughs> but after a while, I understood why. I think it's better when you just do this versus having the home button. And, and some people will argue differently. But I can tell you this, that God was telling us that, hey, loving your neighbor like you love yourself, that's good. But loving your neighbor like I love you, that's better. And that's the command that Jesus was giving to love as we love, as he loves us. And, and, and he didn't just say this because it's good for you to do. He said this because it's good for you to experience. See, if we love one another like that at FX Church, that means that, yes, I'm treating each other, other people right, but other people are treating me right. I get to experience what it's like. I get to know what it's like to truly be loved by other people in the world around me and not just God. I mean, we need that. So God is thinking about this, and he's thinking about the fact that this is a great way to grow the kingdom of God. This is the awesome, an awesome church growth method. That's why Jesus said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples. How? Because of how you treat each other. When people can see that you love, when, you, when God sees or the world sees us as one, the Bible teaches that causes them to want to be a part of the family. But also notice that they're not going to be a part of the family just because you say you're a believer. They'll want to join, be, be a part of the family because they can see you're a believer because of your love. I hope today's message really helped you. God does have an amazing future for you. And you'll experience that future as you apply God's word to your life. So don't just hear today's message. Actually do what it says and you'll see God do something amazing in you. I'd love for you to pray about becoming a partner with Andre Butler Ministries. Our mission is to help people who are far from God experience the future God has for them all across this country and all across the world. And to do that, we need your help. And so I would love for you to pray about becoming a part of our online family. If you're interested in becoming a partner with us, then text the word PARTNER to 313-356-3366. Once again, that number is 313-356-3366 or you can go to our website, andrebutler.com, and sign up to be a partner there as well. Thank you for all those who've already given. It's because of your giving that people are able to watch this now, that they were blessed today, that so many lives have already been changed, and we believe that together we're gonna reach millions for Jesus. And remember, God has a future for you. I'm excited about my newest book, Why Exist, Find Your Why. You know, I believe life doesn't really make sense until you know your why, until you know your purpose. And so God had me write a book to help people to discover not only that you have a purpose, but to discover what it is. One of my favorite parts of this book is a chapter called The Why Test, where we ask you certain questions to help you zoom in on what excites you, on what God made you to do. So I really want to encourage you to get a hold of this at andrebutler.com and find your why.